Good evening and welcome to the Institute. Uh, my name is Gerarka Lynch and I am an instructor at the Math Programme here. And I'm very pleased to present to you James Tanton this evening. Uh, James uh, received his PhD from Princeton in Math. Uh, he's an author, a consultant and an ambassador for the Mathematical Association of America in Washington, DC. He's currently serving as their mathematician at large. He has taught mathematics both at university and high school institutions. James is absolutely committed to promoting effective and joyful mathematics thinking, learning and doing at all levels of the education spectrum. He has written a number of books, including the Encyclopedia of Mathematics and two wordless puzzle books, Without Words and More Without Words, which have been translated in Serbian. And he has developed two DVD great courses. He advises on curriculum, consults with teachers and gives demonstration classes and professional development across the globe. James also leads the MAA's Curriculum Inspirations Project, and he is the founder of an exciting new initiative, the Global Math Project. So I'm pleased to present to you James Hunton. Okay. Am I on? I am on. So hello, thank you so much for having me come. I so appreciate being here in Abu Dhabi. It's a great honor. Um, before I begin, I have to ask one very important question. Are you aware that there is an international mathematics salute? Do you know the international math salute? No. Would you like to learn the international math salute? The answer is yes. Good answer. All right. Watch out. It's a very strange salute. This truly is a salute being done all around the world. I promise you, it's probably being done in Sydney and Tokyo and Belgrade right now. You need your arms free for this. It's a very strange salute. So watch out. Arms free. And it goes as follows. You put your arms out front. First step. Then it goes right hand over left hand. That's the hard part, right over left. Got it? All right. Then you go palm to palm, and then the salute gets weird. You wiggle your little fingers. Then you wiggle your thumbs. Then you wiggle your little fingers again. And then when you're ready, just come back. <laughs> what? Oh, come on, Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Should I do it again? Yeah. So now you've got a sense what this talk's going to be like. You're now meeting me, James Tanton, the mathematician. I'll do it again for you. In fact, I'm going to confuse the camera people. I'm going to go stand at the back of the room this time so people at the back can see me. All right. So camera people can't see this. Sorry, camera people. Here goes again. The international math salute. I'm not joking. This truly is an international math salute. Arms out front. Right hand over left hand. I'm not cheating. It really is my right hand over my left hand. Palm to palm. Wiggle the little fingers, wiggle the thumbs, wiggle the little fingers again, and when you're ready, just come on back. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, heavens. Ha. <sighs> yes, no? Now the camera can see me again. What's going on? Oh, someone's figured out it is possible. Yes? And then I'm doing something, you're right. So the hands go some clever way. And if you can you do the wiggle wiggle? <laughs> hmm. Yes, close. That's really close. Oh, yes. Oh, 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 you want to show me? Okay. It's possible. Would you like me to give the answer away? Yes, yes, well done, well done. Would you like me to give the answer away? Would that be helpful? Yes. yes? Okay, I'll give it half away. That's the sort of person I am. I'll give you, I'll give you like a, a halfway step. I've actually given you a problem. You have a problem right now, and it's a problem to which you know what the answer is. That's the final answer, is that right? So what's a good problem-solving strategy if you know what the answer is meant to be? Work backwards. So let's work backwards from this. Let's reverse engineer this. Here's the answer. So this must have come from, what, that? Yep. And if you loosen up your fingers, does that feel different from what you were doing? That feels weird, doesn't it? All right, I have half helped you. I start at the end, and we got to that funny feeling middle position. Your job now is can you start at the beginning and somehow get to that funny feeling middle position. I'm only giving you half a hint. Does that help at all? Yes, yeah, helping some people. Yes? Yes, yes. 
The international maths students made it to Abu Dhabi. Finally, excellent. So what, what we'll do, we do have a question and answer session coming up later at the end of this today. So if you're very bored with what I've been talking about for the next hour, feel free at the end to ask me about this, and I'll give it completely away if you want. But while I'm being very boring for the next hour, feel free to secretly practice this in the seat behind you. And you can just amuse yourself while you're doing it until the hour's up. Does that sound like a good deal? I think I've lost people. Excellent. I think I'm set for the hour. You guys are fine. I can leave and I'll come back in an hour. All right. All right. So I'm James. My name is James. My career is somewhat unusual. I did not follow the usual path. I grew up in Australia. Uh, my accent's only half Australian because my father was British. So it's half British, half Australian accent. And I had a very unenlightened mathematical experience in my school days. My schooling was very, very rote, full of memorization. I did not enjoy mathematics as a kid. Somehow in university, I found mathematics again. I took some courses in mathematics and realized, oh my goodness, this is what mathematics really is. Thank goodness I became a mathematician. I went to the US in 1988 to get my PhD. I did the whole proper full, 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 full on mathematics experience. But I've always loved teaching. So I was in the high powered research world for a while, but I then went and worked in universities that had a high teaching focus. I loved to teach. And then I somehow got interested in the state of mathematics education back in the United States, and I looked at the K through 12 curriculum. And when I looked at it back at the late 1990s, I saw the same joyless root memorization going on that I went through as a kid some 30 years earlier, still happening in America at that time. And I got, I got worried about that. I did not want another generation of students to go through the experience I had wanting to run away from mathematics. So rather than just complain about what was going on, I left the university world and decided to become a high school teacher myself, a full-time high school teacher, and I did that. And my personal challenge while I was being a high school teacher was, how can I teach the human joyous story of mathematics while still getting my kids to pass all those exams, because I had no control of the exams my kids were doing. So I still had to pass, get those kids to pass those exams with speed, with competency, and still enjoy the story of mathematics. And I really developed all sorts of ways to think about what's, what is the storyline of, say, Algebra 2, or some other topic I was meant to teach, pre-calculus, who knows what these things really are. And one of the storylines I developed is this one called Exploding Dots. Because I realized my students had a very hard time, my high school students had a very hard time understanding their mathematical story from kindergarten all the way up through high school, through college and beyond. So I'm going to share with you tonight one of those storylines, this one, Exploding Dots. And it's kind of a special one, because something very big is happening in two weeks' time. Someone once told me, since they love the story of Exploding Dots so much, they said, James, you should bring Exploding Dots to the world. So I'm curious, has anyone in this room heard of an hour of code? Code.org. All right. They were very successful. In October 2013, they declared a special week of October to be Hour of Code Week, and they invited children from all across the planet to just take, take part in some hour of coding during that week. And they brought coding to the world. They were very successful. About a quarter of a billion students since then have actually done coding because of them. They're marvelous. So we said, we need to do the same thing for math. So October 10th, 10, 10, 2017, is the start of Global Math Week. And we're asking teachers and students all across the planet to sign up and have a first experience of exploding dots with their students and take part in a global conversation. We've been promoting this for the last little while. And right now, as I just checked the numbers about half an hour ago, over 584,000 students from 104 different countries have signed on to do some exploding dots together during the week of October 10th. I'm wondering if you'd like to sign on as well and take part. But I want to teach you the story first. See if you'd like exploding dots. And I'm going to start and show you how mathematics, how very sophisticated mathematics, can actually evolve from very simple ideas. I'm going to start this, this session by assuming we know nothing. I'm going to start at the very beginning of mathematics. I'll start at kindergarten. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to whip through grade school arithmetic, some high school algebra. If there's time, I'll get to some calculus, some undergraduate mathematics, and maybe if there's extra time, get to some unsolved research problems still baffling mathematicians to this day all in the next 45 minutes or so. It's a tall order. Let's see if we can do it. The question is, are you ready? Yeah. The answer is always yes. Yes, let's do it. So the story of exploding dots, starting at the very beginning, if you think I'm going to be insulting your intelligence for the first 15 minutes, hang with me. This is exactly what I did with my college students, exactly what I do with my high school students. It's the story of mathematics. And all begins with a story that's not true. Here goes. When I was a child, I invented a machine. Not true. 
And all the machine was, was a row of boxes that would go as far to the left as ever I desired. Grand. And being a somewhat strange child, I gave this machine a strange name. I called it a 2-1 machine, but in a funny backwards way. Okay, I was a young child, I knew no different, I could write things backwards, fine. And the idea of this machine is you put in dots. For example, I put in one dot, that dots will always go in the rightmost box, zoom. There it is. It's not very exciting, it will just stay as one dot. However, you put in a second dot, dot number two, here it comes, always the rightmost box, zoom. Then something exciting happens. Because whenever there are two dots in a box, they explode, kaboom! To be replaced by one dot, one place to the left. Hence the name 2-1 machine. Does that make sense? All right, so two dots become ones. So now I'm going to say the code for two is nothing, 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 one dot, zero dots. I'm just going to write one, zero. Okay, here comes the third dot. Always the rightmost box. Zoom. So the code for three is now nothing, 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 one dot, one dot, one, one. I have a feeling putting in a fourth dot is going to be particularly exciting. Are you ready for it? Here it comes, the rightmost box, zoom, kaboom, dot. Again, kajing, dot. Wow. Okay, so the code for four is one, zero, zero. What's the code for five going to be? Can you see it in your mind's eye? One, zero, one, one more dot. What's the code for six going to be? One, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero. Let's do it. Here's five. Here comes the six dot. Zoom. Kabow! Dot. You're right. One, one, zero. What's the code for 13? Not one, one, one. One, zero, 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 zero. All right, one with some people say, okay, one with three zeros, some people say. Any other answers? Some people say, no, I heard no. One, one, zero, one. One, one, zero, one. Some people might be on to me, I know. But here's my point. This is, this is my only point. Hours of fun to be had working out codes for different numbers of a 2 one machine. That's it, my only point. Because then, in my untrue story, I had a flash of insight. Because I realized instead of doing a 2-1 machine, I could also do a 3-1 machine. Whoa. So how's that one going to work? Three dots explode, become one. OK, put in one dot. Not very exciting. Zoom. Stays as one dot. Put in a second dot. Always the rightmost box. Zoom. Stays as two, doesn't it, this time? You need three to become one. Put in a third dot. Zoom. Kaboom! Dot. One zero. Put in a fourth dot. One one. Put in a fifth dot. Am I going too fast? Put in a sixth dot. All right, here's six. You, see, you told me five is one, two. So six would be a six dot. Zoom. Kaboom. Yep, two, zero. Thirteen. I skipped some numbers again. I did it again to you. Two, one, one, one. One, one, one. One, 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 one. Zero, one, one, one. One, two, one. One, two, two, one. Something. It'll be something. My only point is, hours of fun working out codes for this machine. Not, not one. But, okay, one, zero, zero, lots of things. Hours of fun. But then, I had another flash of insight. Because I realized if I doing a three-one machine, I could do a four-one or a five-one. In fact, let's go crazy. Let's go all the way up to a ten-one machine. And let's be particularly crazy. Let's put in 273 dots. What is the secret code for the number 273 in a 10-1 machine? You're on to me. I know, I, know, I know you know what this machine is doing. But I am a young child in this story. I am going to be slower than you. I'm going to actually do it. Are you ready? Yeah. The answer is always yes. I'm going to put in 273 dots in this machine. Here goes. Always the rightmost box. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, twenty. Tell me when I've got enough. Now, no. How about now? Is that enough? Is two seventy-three dots? Yes. Good answer. 
All right, I'm going to work it out. I'm going to think through this slowly. Yes, no question. Will there be any explosions right now? Yes. How many explosions will there be? 27 explosions, kaboom, kapow, gazing, gazak. Any dots left behind? There'll be three left behind. So 27 explosions. Each explosion makes a dot. You said three dots left behind. There they are. One, two, three. My paper's getting messy now. Each explosion makes a dot. So how many dots will appear in this box? Can I get away with just writing 27 and getting tired of drawing dots? Is that okay? All right. Any more explosions now? Two more explosions. Any dots left behind? Seven dots left behind. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two explosions. Kaboom! Kapow! So what's the secret code for 273? Two dots, seven dots, three dots. You're absolutely right. 273 is the secret code for 273. All right, you're on to me. What are these machines really doing? What's going on? Bases? OK, oct all these fancy words for bases and place value. Absolutely. In fact, let me be very, very clear. Let's go back to the 2-1 machine for a moment. So I set this game up so that dots here, zoom, always worth one. There's always one dot, one dot, one dot. But then two of these, two of these ones in the 2-1 machine explode become that. So this dot here must be worth two ones. It must be worth two. And two of these, kaboom, two twos made one of those. So this dot here must be worth two twos, which is four. And two of these makes one of those. Must be worth eight. And two of these makes one of those. And two of them makes them one of the next ones. And two of them makes one of those. Do you want to keep going or not? Are we bored? We're bored. Good answer. 128, 256, we can keep going. All right. 13. Are any of those codes correct? You said 1101 is, is the case. Can you now actually see, I mean literally see, 1101 is correct for 13? 1 8, 1 4, no 2s, and 1 1. Is that 13? Beautiful. Welcome to binary. Welcome to base 2. Welcome to writing numbers in base 2, just as computers use. We can encode all of mathematics in just two symbols, 1 and 0, which computers like because they're all based on switches that are either on or off. Welcome to computer science. The 3 1 machine, be the same idea. Dots here are always worth one. Now three of these make one of those. So dot here must be worth three. Three of those makes one of them. Three threes makes nine. Three nines makes the next one. And so on. Now, tell me, what's the code for 13? Several people did say 111. I was pretending not to hear them. Because 111 is correct. Can you see it? 19, 13, and 11. Is that indeed 13? 13 in base 3 is 111. Beautiful. And the final one, which is base 10, dots here are worth 1. 10 of these makes one of those, must be worth 10. 10 of these makes one of thems. 10 tens is 100. 10 hundreds makes 1,000, and so on. 200, 7, 10, and 3 ones. Is that 273? Welcome to base 10. In fact, we literally speak base 10, at least in English. 200, if I write this out, 73, oops, so my handwriting is atrocious. Can you see I'm literally saying 200? 200s, there they are. 7T, that T-Y in English, what's that short for? 10, so actually we're literally saying 7 10s, there they are, and 3. We're speaking 10-1 machine. I'm curious, in Arabic, how do you say 273? Are you saying two hundreds, seven tens, and three by any chance? So you're speaking, ba you're speaking base 10? So, okay, just different order, but you, seven, you say three units, seven tens, and two hundreds? Yes, no? Both, okay, you say it all, all right. We're there. This is an interesting question. So we've now got two different cultures that have all gone base 10. Why have these, we humans, why do we like the number 10 so much on matters of counting and arithmetic? Because we humans are built to think that 10 is a very good number for counting. Though there are some cultures that went base 20. Apparently they're very much aware of their toes. So some cultures actually are base 20. There are some cultures that realize 
there's a very natural and easy way to count to 12 on one hand, and they created base 12. Do you know how to count to 12 on one hand in a very natural way? Lots of Southeast Asia, lots of uh, in parts of India. Yes, your thumb, use your thumb as a pointer. Each long finger is naturally broken into three sections. You count to 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So some cultures went base 12, probably because of this. In fact, the Western world has some vestiges of base 12 in matters of trades and measures. For example, how many inches are in a foot? 12 inches a foot. In a, in a dozen, well, a dozen is how many of those things? 12 comes up a lot in trade because 12 is a friendly number. Well, often when you're in trade, you want to do like half of something or a third of something or a quarter of something. 12 is a very good number for halves, thirds, and quarters. 10 is actually a bad number. It's okay for halves, but thirds and quarters get messy. So often in practical matters, 12 is a good number to go with. Anyhow, we in our society seem to go with base 10. So for the next part of this talk, I'm going to go through base 10, just as society wants. Society realizes we're base 12. Oh, by the way, I need to know that Martians have four fingers on two hands. What would Martians say is the natural way to go? Base 8, they'll say octal. They think that's the way to count. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. We went base 10 only because of our humanness. So let me go through the mathematics we typically learn in school in base 10. So we know how to write numbers now, 273. What's the first thing you learn in math class to do with numbers? What happens next? Adding. So let's do addition. So let me do a simple addition problem first, like 234 plus 123. Is that straightforward? 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 3 plus 4 is 7. Is that right? 357? Correct. Did you like what I just did? No. What didn't you like about it? Oh, I started from the wrong side. I should go the other direction, right to left? Okay. Do you get the same answer? So what's the big deal? Ah. Uh, okay. I'll tell you a true part of the story. You know I grew up in Australia. We were speaking English. So in my classes, I was being taught to read left to right. Every class except my math class, because in math class, I was being taught to read right to left. So I was taught, trained to go seven, then five, then three. And you, said, you just told me that problem is too nice. You want a nastier problem. How about 234 plus 189? How's that? Two plus one is three. Three plus eight is 11. Four plus nine is 13. The answer is 311 to 13. <laughs> I even said it correctly. 311 to 13. I'll draw you a picture to show I'm correct. Here's what we actually did. Here's a 10-1 machine. I had two hundreds, I had three tens, and four ones. Is that 234? Okay. I was asked to add 100. Okay, 100. I was asked to add eight tens. No worries, I can add eight tens. And I was asked to add nine ones. Piece of cake, here they are. Do I indeed have three hundreds? Do I indeed have 11 tens? And do I indeed have 13 ones? 300, 11, 13 is absolutely solid correct. So, as a professional mathematician, I thoroughly endorse that answer. It is mathematically correct. It's society that thinks I'm weird. Society thinks me saying 311 to 13 is absurd. That is mathematically correct. There really are 11 tens. Nothing wrong. There really are 13 ones. So, for society's sake, not, my, not math's sake, society's sake, what do you want me to do to that answer? Explode. Do you want to explode from 11 or from 13 first? 13, you want to go right to left. So I'll do the 11 first. So we'll do 10 dots from the 11. Explode, 10 explode, kaboom, off they go. They leave what, one dot behind, and an extra dot there, 401 13. I'm correct, 401 13, absolutely correct, nothing wrong with that answer. Sounds weird, I admit that, but only for society's sake. Do you want me to explode again? Yeah. 10 explode, kaboom! Leaving what, three behind? Extra dot here? 423. Absolutely good. Now we're good. Do you like that answer? 423. Most people say 20, but you can say 2T. So I'm curious how you were taught then. So you were taught to go from right to left, 4 plus 9 is 13. Are you allowed to write 13? So what were you taught to write in school? You write three, so then what did you do? Okay. I heard people say carry a one just then. In my language, what did you just do? Yeah, you actually took 10 of these dots here and made an extra dot there. 
you're actually exploding as you go along. So what you were taught, it sounds like, was to go from right to left and do the explosion as you go along. Fine, that's all good. I personally like to go left to right, as I was personally taught to read, and do the explosions at the end. All fine, all good. All correct, good mathematics, surprisingly, is actually good and correct. It's just a matter of style. Go right to left, left to right, doesn't matter. It's all good. Great. Um, let's carry on. What do you do next? Subtraction. Two halves. Let's do some multiplication. 2874 times 3. What's the most obvious three second answer to that question? The most, three seconds, that's it. Grab a calculator, it's good, yep. How about this answer? Six, yes, 6, 24, 21, 12. Do you see what I'm doing? Because what we're really being asked to do in this problem is take the number 2000s, 800s, 710s, and 41s, and triple everything. Is that right? Triple them? So if I have 2000s, how many thousands would I, would I have then if I tripled it? Six. Six of them. Okay, really messy paper now. If I had 800s and say triple them, how many hundreds would I have? 24. 710s becomes 2110s. Bad, bad writing. And 12 ones? Is that right? Then we've cracked. Nothing wrong with that answer. Solid and fine. As a professional mathematician, I give my stamp of approval to that answer. The fun part, by the way, is saying it. How do you say that number? 1T. Yep, 6,200, 2421T12. Actually, by the way, society is fickle. If I say 21T, does that sound weird? Yes. If I said 2400, does that sound weird? I don't know what to say about society. It's hard to follow society's rules. All right, beautiful. Um, could we fix that answer up for the rest of the world? What do you want to do first? Explode which? 24. 24. Two explosions. Leave four behind. Extra two dots here. 8,421 T12. Could we keep going? Do you want to keep going? Oh. Uh, the answer is always yes, bother. All right, okay, what's one next? 12 or the, 20, 12 or the 21? Two explosions. 12, okay, 12. These two behind, extra dot there. 8, 4, 22, 2. Two explosions, leave two behind. Extra two dots there. 8, 6, 2, 2. 8,622. How's that? Or 8,622. Yes? We're so far so good? All right, grand. This is a speed experience because we're going to whip through all the school arithmetic. Okay, you did say subtraction first. Um, the only reason I hesitated on subtraction is because I actually don't believe subtraction exists. To me, subtraction is still addition. It's the addition of the opposite. All right, so that puts me in a bit of a pickle. So far, I've been talking about these things, which I've been calling dots, which you can't see. There we go. So now I need the notion of the opposite of a dot, which gives me two problems. What would you like me to draw for the opposite of a dot? Circle. Cir okay, circle, guess that's it, circle. And next question, what would you like me to call it? What do you want to? Got a very vocal front, any in the back? Todd. I keep hearing Todd, okay. Why Todd, what's that? Dot backwards. All right, I can't argue with that. That's brilliant. All right, Todd's it is. Okay, the idea of a Todd is the opposite of a dot. It's like matter and antimatter. So apparently in science fiction, if I bring matter and antimatter together, what happens? Oh, they explode. Um, I've already got an explosion. Let's just say they just go poof. They just like, annihilate. They just disappear. Is that right? So here, if I put a dot and a Todd together, my picture equals nothing. There, that. That's my picture. Nothing. Is that right? Okay. So here's to me is subtraction. 534 to okay, 112, something like that. To me, it's really this picture. Because I don't believe in subtraction. It's five hundreds, five dots, three tens, three dots, four ones, four dots. So far, so good. Plus, plus the opposite of 100. One anti hundred. One Todd. One anti-ten. One Todd there. 
plus two anti-ones. Two Todds there, is that correct? All right. Now, will there be any dot and Todd annihilations? Well, yes, lots of them. For example, my pictures are going to get messy here, but poof, they just disappear. Poof. Poof. So far so good? So I've got, what, four here left over, two here, and two there. It's as though I went left to right again, five take away one is four, three take away one is two, four take away two is two, 422. Left to right, I tell you it's good. Or was that problem too nice? Do you want a, a juicy one? Yes. Here comes a juicy one. Let's try 523, take away 146, how's that? All right, five take away one is four, two take away four is negative two, three take away six is negative three, the answer is 400, negative two is negative three, done. <laughs> Left to right, piece of cake. Great, I love it. Am I right? Society might think I'm weird, but mathematically am I right? Yes, I am, I'll even draw you my picture. 500, two tens and three, add to that one anti-hundred, one Todd, Four anti tens, four tods, six anti ones, six tods. Will there be some annihilations? Of course. Poof. 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 Sorry, these are very messy pictures. Uh, poof, poof, poof. Four actual hundreds, two anti tens, three anti ones, 400, negative 2t, negative 3. Beautiful. Done. As a professional mathematician, I will stop right now. For society's sake, could we fix up that answer? How? What could we do? Oh, de-explode, backwards explode, unexplode. I heard all three different things there. All right, very important question. What's the sound effect for unexploding? Okay, sucking sound. I assume you want to unexplode one of these dots here, is that right? This dot here is really 10 dots from over yonder, so let's unexplode it. And it becomes 10 dots over here. There's five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I've got one less dot there. I've got an extra 10 dots there. So far, so good? Any annihilations? Yeah. Why, yes, poof, poof. So it's really eight. 380 negative three, grand. Again? Yes. Again. 10 explode. So one less there, extra 10 here. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Extra 10 there. Some annihilations? Of course, three, poof, 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 leaving seven there, 377. Beautiful. Is that better? Does society like that answer? Yeah. Society is so demanding. All right, great. By the way, I actually kind of like my answer because I think I can see 377 right away from it. What's that four really? It's 400, isn't it? That negative two is really negative 20, is that right? And that three is really negative three. Can you see 377? I kind of like left to right when I'm actually being serious. There it is, I can see the answer either way. I bet you were taught to go right to left, is that right? I bet you did something called borrowing. You know, your borrowing is just unexploding too. It's just another style thing. You prefer to go right to left and unexplode as you go along? That's fabulous. I prefer to go left to right, unexplode at the end? That's also fabulous. It's all fabulous. Math is fabulous. All right. Addition, subtraction, uh, multiplication, leaving. Right, the speed experience of all of the school mathematics. Here goes, division. Okay, this is the one that was actually really scary for me as a kid. Because I remember learning this in Australia in grade five, doing something called long division. I was taught a very strange, bizarre algorithm as a kid. I remember this clearly. Because this is the first time in my math class I was absolutely aware that I did not understand anything I was actually doing. I could do it very well, and I was just working to please my teacher. I was absolutely very aware as a kid, I was just doing this to please my teacher, and I did not understand what I was taught. Would you like to see the very strange, bizarre method I was taught as a kid in Australia back in the 1970s? The answer is always yes. All right. In Australia, some 40 years ago, we had to start by drawing a funny symbol. By any chance, were you taught to do that too? Yeah. 
We have to write the big number underneath and the small number to the left. Huh. Do you know how in every math class I was being taught to go right to left, right to left, right to left, which I thought was strange. Suddenly I was being told now, no, 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 just go left to right. After all that years of training, you just switched directions on me. There are many bizarre things I do not, that, that struck me as bizarre as a kid. So we were told, okay, suddenly you just go left to right now. Okay, why not? Look at the two and ask how many times does 12 go into two? Say, don't be silly, it doesn't go into two. Is that what you guys were taught to do? So then we asked to look at 2, 7, 27. I thought that was bizarre. Do you have any right to say 27? Because that's not the number. The number's 276. Can you just say 27? I thought that was strange, the kid. I must have been a strange child. In any case, I obeyed. We asked, how many times does 12 go to 27? Twice. But then we had to write the two on the top. This is the scary part, because apparently alignment mattered. That was really scary, getting that part right. Then in Australia, we had to actually write two times 12 is 24. Did you guys have to do that? Yeah. All right. Okay, next bizarreness. Let's just do a subtraction problem. Why not? <laughs> okay, we'll just do subtraction. 24, 7, 8, 24 is 3. That is odd. But that's not the oddest part of all. Because guess what happens now? So yeah, so you, you sounds like you're doing exactly the same thing I went through. We've got this three here. We've still got the six dangle here. We had to, in Australia, we had to actually draw arrows. I don't know if you had to draw arrows. The six comes down, gets attached to the three, and that three just magically changes to 36. <laughs> just changes number now. I kid you not, I thought this was strange. Anyhow, you ask how many times the 12 go into 36? Goes in three times. Three times 12 is 36. Do another subtraction problem, you get zero, and apparently that's good. That's what I was taught. And it sounds like that's what you were doing too. Okay, it's very hard for us adults to see how bizarre that is. We are so familiar with it that the familiarity gets in the way to realize it's bizarre. That is truly bizarre. So I want to understand long division for the first time in my life. I want to have some, I want to have some therapy. My 10-year-old self needs help with this, with you now. So I'm first going to check, what is division in any case? Well, here's one terribly tedious way to do division. I could actually draw 276 dots. Uh oh, I'm doing it again. Tell me when to stop. So that's 276? Okay, 10 more. Okay, so I'm looking for how many 12s and 26. I'm ask, basically asking, how many groups of 12 can I find in a picture of 276? So if I have the patience, I could do this. I could say, okay, here's a group of 12, here's a group of 12, here's a group of 12, and so on. If I had the patience to really do that, how many groups of 12 allegedly do I get? 23. So I could do that. I could just draw a picture of 276, circle groups of 12, find how many groups of 12 I see. Bingo. Let me do that method, but with a more sophisticated picture. Let me draw a 10-1 machine version of 276. Let's do it in red. Let's be bold. Here's 276. Whoops. It's two dots, seven dots, and six dots. Is that right? 12 looks like, actually what does 12 look like? One dot and two dots. Okay, so now there's a little subtly here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push this audience a little bit hard here. What I was really doing there, I was circling actual 12 dots, groups of 12. I didn't actually physically draw 12 dots then, I just physically drew three dots, but there are 12 dots in there. All 12 dots must be sitting in there, is that right? They must have, must have been sitting in here at that level and what, 10 explodes to spill over? So there really are 12 dots here. They all happen to be there, but an explosion happened. Keep that in mind. Some spillage occurred. All right, now the question is, 12 looks like one dot next to two dots. Here's a picture of 276. 276, make it clearer. Do you see any one dot next to two dots in that picture of 276? Do you see any 12s there? Yeah, people are nodding. There's one dot next to two dots. Is that right? Now, that subtle point, I didn't physically circle 12 dots then, but there are 12 dots in that loop. Are they in the left part or the right part of the loop? They must all be sitting there, an explosion must have spilled them over. So actually there's one group of 12 right at that level. Yeah? Any other 12s in that picture? Any other one dots next to two dots? Yep, another one right there at that level. So 12 dots must be in the right part of the loop, another one at that level. Any more one dots next to two dots? 
One dot next to two dots? Yeah? One dot next to two dots? One dot next to two dots? There are two at the tens level and three at the ones level. There must be 23 of them. Whoa! Grade five long division all of a sudden. Yes? You know what? This bizarre algorithm is actually that picture. Of course they were teaching me good maths as a kid. My teachers weren't, weren't being, being evil. Can you see what that algorithm is doing? It first asked me to look at that two. In that picture, it's just those two dots. Do we see any 12s in that just picture of two dots? No. Then I was asked to look at 27. Well, I disagree with calling it 27 still, but what I'm really asking for, look at two dots and seven dots. Do we see any 12s there? We did, we circled, we circled two loops of them. In fact, we even wrote two. In fact, even my algorithm wrote two. Tell me, what's this bizarre subtraction business? Okay, I've dealt with all but those final three dots at the bottom. There's still three dots left over to deal with, is that right? Subtraction now makes sense. Now, tell me, what about this bizarre thing where there's three and the six magically combined to make 36? What am I really doing? I'm just revealing the next six dots. That's all I'm shifting my focus to. Now think of three dots and six dots. We found three more loops at that level, three more loops. The subtraction tells me there's no dots left over. So actually, the long division algorithm is doing the correct thing. Should we do another one? Do you want a nice one or a hard one? 31825 divided by 102. Yeah. All right. Since I've got all the paper, I guess I'm doing it up here. So I'll do it up here. See if this makes sense. Let me draw the number, 31825. Hardest part's going to be drawing these things. 3, 1, 8, 2, whoop, 5. Did I do that correctly? Because if I get it wrong now, I'm in, I'm in trouble. OK, 102, what does that look like? Oh, this is a big one. 1 dot, 0 dots, 2 dots. Now, again, all 102 dots must have been in the rightmost box, and a lot of explosions must have happened. So all 102 dots are really in the right part of that picture. So now we're looking for one blank two. Do you see any one blank twos in that picture? Yeah. Lots of them. Let's do it. One blank two. Is that good? All 102 dots must be here, and they must have spilled over. Is that right? Any more one blank twos? OK, I'm getting nervous about my loops getting messy. Can I do this? One blank two. Is that still OK? OK, any more? One blank two. Oh, this is great. How are we doing? Keep going? How about this? One blank two. Yeah? Keep going? Are we having fun? Who knew long division could be fun? One blank two. One blank two. Ooh. Ooh. What's the answer? Yes. It's 312. And how do you want to read that final dot? To be what grade level are you, you might just say remainder one dot. Point one? Something like that, something like that. I would say plus one dot still waiting to be divided by 102. Plus one 100 tooth. Bingo. There it is, long division. You can actually see long division. I mean, literally see it. If the remainders, you'll see the remainders. Literally see them. There it is. All right. How are we doing so far? I've whipped our way through grade school arithmetic. Is it time for high school? High school math and calculus. All right, let's do it all. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is nothing in this story that cares about our humanness. Everything we did just now, we could do in Martian, and it'll be fine. We could do a computer, base two, it'll be fine. The math doesn't care what machine we're in. So I'm going to repeat this entire lecture now in all machines all at once to prove that I'm right. Are you ready for that? Good answer. It has to be yes. Here's how I'm going to do that to you. I'm going to do the math again in a machine, but I'm not going to tell you which machine I'm thinking of. I've got a number in my brain. 
I'm just not going to tell you what it is. It could be a 10 run machine, not going to tell you. It could be a 3 run machine, you won't know. It could be a 5 one, it's just the mood I'm in. I'm not going to tell you what machine's in my head. So you've got some machine, but you don't know what machine it is. Now, just to give a nod to high school algebra all across this planet, if you don't know a number, high school algebras seem to be obsessed with a certain letter of the alphabet to represent that number. Always X. I don't know why it's X. X, X, X. So I will just give a nod to high school algebra all across the world and call this an X1 machine. You just don't know what X is in my head. It could be a 10 run machine, I'm not telling you. X could be 7, you just don't know. It's in my brain. That's all you know about this machine. Oh, actually, you do know more. You do know that I've always set the game up so dots there are always worth one. One dot, one dot, one dot. You do know that X of these makes one of those. So X1s be X of them. You know, X of these makes one of those. That's be worth XX's, which is X squared. X of these must be one of those. XX squared is X cubed, XX cubed is X to the fourth, and so on. Actually, just as a check, suppose I reveal to you X really is 10 in my head, that this is a 10 run machine. Are there the correct numbers for a 10 run machine? One, 10, 10 squared, 100, yep, 10 cubed. Is that correct for a 10 run machine? Okay. Or, change my mind, suppose X was two in my brain. Is that, are they the correct numbers for a 2-1 machine at the very beginning of today? One, two, two squared, four, two cubed, bingo. That really does represent all machines all at once. Okay, now we're ready for it. High school algebra, no warning, just do it. 2x squared plus 7x plus 6, that thing, divided by x plus 2, that thing. We've gone from grade 5 to grade, I don't know what we're in, something. Grade 9, I guess it's just a quadratic by linear. Okay, grade 9. What do you think? Looks scary. First question, can we at least draw it? Two x squareds? Okay, I guess that's two of these guys. Yes? Seven x's? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven x's? Yeah? And six ones? All right. That's a picture of two x squared plus seven x plus six. We're divided by x plus two. What does x plus two look like? One x and two, one dot and two dots. Do you see any one dot next to two dots in that picture? Yeah. There's one at that level, yeah? And again? And again? How am I doing? I'm going fast. Yeah? Ooh. How do I read that answer? It's two of the x level plus three of the ones level. Two x plus three. My real question is, do you feel like you've been there before? Was that deja vu? Does that picture look familiar? In fact, I think I saved it. High school algebra? Grade five long division. Are those pictures identical? Whoa. In fact, suppose I told you x really was 10 in my head all along. What number is 2x squared plus 7x plus 6? 2 times 100 plus 7 times 10 plus 6, 276, divided by x plus 2? 12 apparently equals 23. Of course it did. We did it. High school polynomial algebra is just grade five all over again, just base x instead of base 10. That's it. My fifth grade teachers taught me high school algebra. It was brilliant. All us teachers in it together, our fifth grade teachers are helping those high school teachers big time, and the college professors. Do you want to do another one? Yes. No. <laughs> I know, now it's getting big. All right, all right, let me pull out a really scary looking example. How about this juicy beast? x to the fourth plus 2x cubed plus 4x squared plus 6x plus 3 all divided by x squared plus 3. Uh, well, I wrote that one. Hang on, let's do this one, then I'll do negative. Um, by the way, 
in some curricula in the US, this will be considered too hard to do in high school. Because I'm dividing by something that's not linear. I'm divided by a quadratic. If you taught something called synthetic division, eh, useless. You think we can do it? Yes. All right, here goes. 1x to the fourth. So far, so good. 2x cubed. Yes? 4x squared. Yes? 6x's. Yes? 3 1's. So far, so good? x squared plus 3. What does that little creature look like? 1x squared, no x's, and 3. Is that right? We're looking for one blank 3. Do you see the one blank 3's there? Lots of them. One blank three. Can I do that? Are we, I'm going fast. If I could do all the other explosions, would they all be actually at that level? And some explosions must have happened. Okay, any other one blank threes? Okay, can I be fast with you guys? Can I go one, one, blank, blank, three, three? Just like I'm getting efficient now. I'm getting tired of drawing loops. How are we doing? One blank three. And what's the answer? Yeah, okay, so it's actually x squared plus two x's plus one. Done. I can see it, I own it, that's nothing. Just draw a picture. Polynomial division, piece of cake. All right, technically my time is up. But this fellow asked me a question. So we now have the question and answer session. He asked me, what about negatives? He's a very smart fellow. Because everything I've just shown you is actually a lie. This method doesn't work in general. In fact, did you see me have to pull out a special piece of paper from my pocket to copy down that example which I previously designed to have him to work out nicely? Did you notice me do that? Because I'm pulling the wool over your eyes. This method doesn't work in general. So, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Do you want to see what can go wrong? Okay. This fellow's right. I've been carefully avoiding negatives. How about something like x cubed minus 3x plus 2 divided by x plus 2? Everything goes awry with something like that. Um, okay, it's hard to see why. If I draw a picture, you might see what goes wrong. Can I draw a picture of x cubed minus 3x plus 2, do you think? Maybe that's doable. Let's see. 1x cubed, no x squareds, 3 anti-x's, 3 tods, is that right? And 2. All right, there's a picture of the top line. We're divided by x plus 2. I think we've done x plus 2 before a lot today. That's what, uh, 1x and 2. You see what goes wrong? I'm looking for one dot next to two dots and that picture ugh, up there. Impossible. It makes me want to weep. I'm, I'm, private, I'm, I'm having a little cry right now because it just can't be done. <laughs> so this fellow seems to think I'm lying about lying, that maybe it can be done. All right, here's an idea. Anyone else have any ideas? A positive box? Replace the Todds with dots. Oh, just change the question. <laughs> that, that works. <laughs> that is a brilliant idea. You're right, if I put, yeah, made those Todds dots. All right. So now is a moment of truth. The reason why I love being a high school teacher is because of a moment like this. The honest truth is, I, we do not need to teach polynomial long division in life. When was the last time in life you actually had to divide some polynomials? Never. The question, will you ever need to know this? No, you will absolutely never need to know this. That's not the point. I will gladly teach high school students polynomial long division, because the moment we're at right now, you've got a problem. 
there's a fabulous life lesson to be learned. I felt as a high school teacher, I was actually teaching life lessons. The vehicle for doing that happened to be this mathematics. And if, sure, you might become a mathematician, might need to do this, great. But for most people, you're never going to do this again in your life. So it's, no, that's not the point. This, this content is a vehicle for what I'm about to teach, is a life lesson. This fellow said something very, very smart. I, in fact, I value his life skills right now. Because I have a feeling he said to himself, look at this dot over yonder. Wouldn't it be nice to have something to go with that dot? I mean, what's that dot over the left yearning for? if I'm looking for this. Yes, I would love to have two dots there. Wouldn't life be easier if there were two dots there? So here's my life lesson right at the moment, and I seriously mean this, this is a moment of life lesson. If there's something in life you want, make it happen, and deal with the consequences. If you want two dots there, make it happen. There they are. But there are consequences. I can't just change that box. It's meant to be empty. So how do I technically keep that box empty? Put two tods in it. Is that box still technically empty? OK. Brilliant. Now, here's the thing about being a mathematician. One often has brilliant ideas, but they don't always turn out to be helpful. I'm serious. Was that helpful or not helpful? So, OK, sort of, because I, I agree at least gets us somewhere, and that kind of feels good. But I don't know if it's really gets all the way there. Unless there's something else in life you want right now. Ah, you're seeing these two dots here. Wouldn't it be nice to have one dot over yonder to go with them, is that right? So here's my advice. If there's something in life you want, make it happen. And deal with the consequences. Okay, that feels good too. At least I get another one of what I want. But I'm still not sure if it's helpful. Feels good. Whoa. I'm looking for one dot and two dots. And you're telling me, here you see one Todd and two Todds. Is that what I just circled there, the exact opposite of what I'm looking for? Is that one anti-version of what I'm looking for? Whoa. And again? Whoa. So what's the answer? I was lying about lying. It actually does work. Whoa. This is the joy of polynomial long division. I do not care about it one whit, but if it brings joy to the heart, joy to the mind, then absolutely do it. Why do we do poetry? Because it brings us joy. Why do we do music? Because it brings us joy. As a teacher of mathematics, why would I want to do it with my kids? Because it can bring us joy. That's it. That's my only point of doing this, to bring joy. Yes, it might have practical applications down the road. Great. That's a bonus. But if it brings us joy, let's absolutely do it. Since so someone asked me for it, I'm going to push this a bit further. Do you want to go to calculus right now? One example of calculus, and I really do have to stop. Try this one. It's so simple that it makes it hard. It's the polynomial one, just one single dot in a whole machine all by itself. There it is. There's the machine, one single dot. I want to divide it by 1 minus x. Now, what does 1 minus x look like? Yeah, it's really a negative x and a 1. So it's 1 anti x and 1 tod, and 1 dot. Is that right? But here's a very sparse picture in which I'm looking for that. And I don't see it at all. This makes me want to weep. Make it happen. What a great piece of advice. Brilliant. <laughs> so I'm guessing you'd like a, what, a tod here? Make it happen. Deal with the consequences. OK, that feels good, because I've got one of what I want. Oh, again, make it happen. Deal with the consequences. OK, I've got another one of what I want. Again, make it happen. Deal with the consequences. Again. Again. Oop. Am I going to be here for a while? Is this an infinite process? I'll be doing this forever. 
Now, the challenge is, how do I read that crazy answer? Yeah, no, another problem. So another problem is I'm missing all the caps on my markers. Yeah, actually, it keeps going to the left, so maybe actually this time it might be able to go from the right. That one is really just a one, isn't it? And an x, and an x squared, and an x cubed, forever? Bingo, series formula. In fact, this often appears in pre-calculus books or even calculus books. Do you want to know the name of that series formula? Most of the books have it this way. They start with this part first and say it equals one over one minus x. That's how it appears in most books. Okay, so in a calculus speak, it's the Maclaurin series, the rational function one over one minus x. Or in a pre-calculus book, it might be called the geometric series formula. Often they'll do x's instead of r's. They might put a's everywhere just to make it look horrible because they're talking about compound interest or something. But there it is. We've just done an infinite series with nothing but dots and boxes. Oh, okay. So, since this is technically the question and answer period, can you ask me now, how can I get to the research level of mathematics as unsolved problems? Can someone ask me that question right now? Five more dots. More dots. Good, uh, yes, I'll answer that question this way. If you want to seriously get to some unsolved research questions that could be within your reach right now, I invite you to start messing around with these dots and boxes. For example, I've been nice to you and did a, I did a 2-1 machine, I did a 3-1 machine, I did a 10-1 machine, I did, I did talk about 5 ones. I always did something 1 machines. What if I got quirky and did something like a 3-2 machine? How does that one work? Three dots explode to become two. Now, we can work out some codes. Put in one dot. Zoom. One. Put in a second dot. Zoom. Two. Put in a third dot, wherever they are. Lost my dots. Zoom. Three explode and become two. Kaboom, boom. So three is two, zero. What's four going to be? Zoom. Whoops. What's five going to be? Zoom. I have a feeling six is going to be particularly exciting. Can you see it in your mind's eye or not? One, zero, zero. I'm, I'm, I'm scared to say a hundred because that's, that's ten one speak. A hundred is ten one speak. Okay, okay, I'll just do it. The best way is just to do it. Here it comes. Here's the six dot. Zoom. Kaboom! Becomes two. There are three of those, it's like kaboom! Become two. Two, one, zero. Whoops. Ah. Two, one, zero. Thirteen. I did it again, I skipped some numbers. Something. Here's a question. In ordinary arithmetic, isn't 13 6 plus 6 plus 1? In this arithmetic, 6 is 2, 1, 0. Another 6 is 2, 1, 0. And a 1 would be a 1. Do we do arithmetic in this? What would you get? I'll even do, this, I'll even do the standard algorithm. 0 plus 0 is 1. 1 and 1 is 2. 2 and 2 is 4. But what happened to the 4, though? Three of those exploding, leaving one behind. Two, one, two, one. Could that be the code for 13? Don't know, but I'll do it. I'm gonna actually do it. I'm gonna put in 13 dots. I'm even gonna like, actually do it this time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Kaboom, dot, dot. Kaboom, dot, dot. Kajing, dot, dot. Kabom, dot, dot. So far so good? Again? Kabloop, dot, dot. Kablip, dot, dot. So far so good? Kajibble, dot, dot. Two, one, two, one. Bingo. All right. But the real question is, we seem to be able to do math in this machine, but what is this machine?
Is it even base values? Something. Fractions. Since I'm technically out of time, I'm going to give it away. Welcome to base one and a half. We are between base two, base one, no, base one and a half is like this, base three halves. Turns out you can have fractional bases. By messing with the numbers, the three, two machine gives you base one and a half, which is weird. And apparently 13 is two, one, two, one in base one and a half if you use the numbers zero, one, and two. Here's the thing, I invite you to work out the first 100 numbers in base one and a half. See if you can find any patterns. Any patterns you find, test them for the next 100 because they're likely to break down. Mathematicians do not understand base one and a half. Every pattern they seem to find seems to eventually break down. Any pattern that you can find that you think you can prove is always true is likely to be a brand new result for this world. Mathematicians do not understand the properties of the powers of one and a half, which seems like such a fundamental concept that we should understand, but we don't. There are too many mysterious questions about the powers of one and a half. This machine is too weird. Too many fundamental questions left over. So, if you want to get on the, on the um, brand new research territory, you're right there. Another option, if you want to confuse your teachers at school, I invite you to translate all your textbook problems to base one and a half and hand in your results in base one and a half. <laughs> you can do that too, that'd be fun. All right, so I've just given you a very, very fast story that started with kindergarten all the way up to, well, whatever that was, graduate level work. The thing is, that's my point. Mathematics is a story, a human story of delight, wonder, and joy. And all I did here was start with a 10-1 machine. All it is is basically just an abacus. The world does this all the time. 10 beads on a rod, get replaced with one bead, one place over. All I did was an abacus here. But if you think very deeply about very simple ideas, look what can unfold. Basically, high school polynomial algebra, piece of cake. Un unsolved research problem, right there. This is what I love about being a mathematician. Think very deeply about very simple ideas, and you're in a universe of wonder and joy and delight. So that's why we want to bring this story to the world October 10th. So that's Global Math Week. Oh, in this country, do you say math or maths? Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Um, OK, then this question. Were we very smart to start Global Math Week on that day, date? If you're in a British school, how do you read that date? If you're in an American school, how do you read that date? Ah, we were clever. We failed on that part, but at least we got that other part right. Okay, so we want to bring this to the world. Obviously, what I did with you was way too much for young students. All we're asking is people to have a first part of the story with, with exploding dots. We have absolutely everything available for everyone on the web for free, and it'll be there forever. And the place to find it all, if you really want to keep explaining this, is www, the Global Math Project. Sorry, it's American there. Org. Everything is there. So if you want to see me do all of this, you've got videos of me, but you'll find I'm really boring. Because basically everything I said to you is already on the web in videos and a whole bunch of text and lots of practice problems. I go further than I did tonight. For example, I did boxes going all the way that way. As a mathematician, that asymmetry really perturbs me. Because that makes me want to ask, what about boxes that way as well? What could they mean? So you could discover even more mathematics playing with this. So we're asking teachers and math leaders and math club leaders and anyone, any interested adult just to have a first experience of exploding dots. Even as people realizing that we speak a 10-run machine is a big epiphany for a lot of people. That's a big moment. Realizing long division works is a big moment for a lot of people. Seeing polynomial algebra working is a big moment for a lot of people. Other things are big moments. That math is just a big moment in and of itself. So I really am going to stop there at this point. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So there's a fellow with a microphone. So you actually do have some questions. I'm happy to answer them. Sinus and cosinus.
And oh, okay, so are there Taylor series? That's the tricky part. So I was choosing very nice rational functions here. I can divide ratios of polynomials. That would be a good challenge. Try it. But if you have to know the series for one, you can just keep playing with it and exploding the dots away and keep playing with it. I agree. Some functions not, that's tricky. How do you do derivatives in this thing? Yes. Hi, thank you very much, first of all. Um, thank you for this wonderful session today. And My I pleasure. had... I had many magical moments. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a mother of young children, and I'm really curious to know, is there some work done to integrate this kind of mathematics in school, at school level? Because, I mean, um, as you said, what you were learning 40 years back, my children are still learning long division that way. Oh, so <laughs> is there any hope in the future? So that, okay, so that's why I left the university to become a high school teacher, because I feel like there is hope for the future. But it's a huge tankage, just this, the inertia to turn the math education system around. It's like, if we can go half a degree, that's a major success. So my work has always been baby steps. For example, I will go visit schools and districts all around the world. And actually, this is being adopted in some curriculum, but it's all like very localized. So this is why we decided we want to bring this to the world with this, this thing called Global Math Week, because we feel like if we can get a critical mass of people all across the globe seeing this is a storyline that can be integrated in the curriculum, maybe there's hope for the future. So it's happening in small pockets, very small isolated pockets. Doesn't help you right now as a mother. Other than you know it exists and you have great conversations with your kids about what, what their school experience is. Because everything they're learning in school is actually correct and right. It's just lovely. It's just probably missing that storyline to it and the context. So maybe it's, you know, unfortunately, it's beholden upon you now to have that conversation with your children and maybe spread the word a bit. So do look up that website. Go look at Exploding Dots. Find, find more information about what I've done and, and learn more for it. And email me, seriously. If you want to keep this conversation going, you, everyone's absolutely welcome to email me. I get a lot of emails. I'll be slow to reply, but I will reply. Yeah. That would be a what? My answer to that is a find out. Play with it. Yes. That actually makes sense. It actually is the 3 2 machine going the other direction. So there is some way to make sense of it. Why not just, I mean, really play with it? How about three dots go to two Todds? What would the base negative one and a half? You can do wonderful, wild, quirky stuff. Yes. I'm a first grade teacher here, and um, for years my students have struggled with place value. And to answer that mother's question, you have just solved um, my problem <laughs> over the last few years of teaching my students place value because this is going to be so easy now. So thank you very much oh, for so giving welcome. me so a welcome. solution. I really appreciate it. Oh. My, but, this, but this is the math. Thank you, mathematics. If you just see the math, it's what it is, what joy it is. That's, that's all my point is. Uh, first of all, great talk. Thank you. I feel like my whole life is a lie. <laughs> but, Oops. <laughs> uh, I'm an engineer, so uh -huh. I dealt a lot with mathematics, calculus, and everything. And uh, this made me like I had so many epiphanies. Like, <laughs> like I went through my half of my life in this... Uh, Hour. But I wanted to ask because I was dealing with calculus and calculus two, three, and do, do you explore in this program the logs and the natural logarithms in terms of exploring so, them? You've got to be very careful here because, um, of course, once you know calculus, you know everything can be represented as series, in which case you feel like it should have some representation here. And I actually struggled with that series for a whole... Oh, right. There, oh, yeah, there is. So, so right. that was just... And I'll also be... I'm going to be very careful with this because I've obviated a calculus question. What I've shown here is true as a statement of algebra. Whenever you have an algebra break expression that has 1 over 1 minus x in it, feel free to replace it with that infinite series and your algebra will be correct. The real calculus question, however, is when is that formula actually true for actual numbers? For example, putting in x equals 2 is clearly wrong. Now we've got the more subtle calculus question. So I've obviated, like, when is that true as a statement of arithmetic? It's certainly true as a statement of algebra. When is it true as a statement of arithmetic? So, so I've obviated that. Welcome to calculus. That's what caused mankind lots of troubles with Newton and Leibniz. When are these things actually true? You know. Um, but then you've got questions about, can I take square roots and logarithms and so forth in a dots and box sort of way? Yes, there are algorithms out there that you do. Uh, it used to be for my parents' generation, they were taught how to do square roots by hand by some algorithm that looked like the dots and boxes method. In fact, I'll tell you, Napier did actually do this sort of thing in the 1600s. He actually said, why stick with 
one-dimensional rows, he created a whole chessboard of each row being its own 2-1 machine. And we started thinking in two dimensions, he realized when he did things on the diagonal, they corresponded to square roots. He started playing with this thing. He also realized that's how he could start turning multiplication problems into addition problems. So he was actually skirting with logarithms right there. So yes, the answer is yes to these things if you're clever and inventive. It's not always obvious how to do it. So it's hard work. Like sines and cosines, there might be a way to really make this work well for that, but I think the best we can do in exploding dots, this is really a statement of algebra. Once you've got one series, then you can get to all the other series, but how do you get the first series? Well, maybe there's a way to do it. That'd be fun. So my only answer to these questions is play with it. Maybe you'll find it, which would be grand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question about um, if, for instance, on the polynomial question, if that yeah. was set, um, say, at an exam in the United States, and the high school student followed, because you got to the answer extremely quickly using your approach. If they did that, would they receive full marks and, and your exploding dot system would be considered that they showed all their working or, or, is it, or would it be rejected? And, so, and so that depends on the question. If the question says, please answer this problem via this method, then you've got no choice. You have to use whatever method the question asks. If the question asks, please solve this problem, then I say it was open. Now, that's the question of the examiner, the call to the examiner. I went through the situation, when I was a high school teacher, my department did not have this discussion with me. They didn't want to know what I was doing, but my kids were consistently getting the right answer and writing these very strange symbols in the margins. They had to accept <laughs> it. They accepted it. Because they never asked, solve this polynomial division via this method, in which case, if the kids could explain their own work, they were, they were golden. So that's a cultural question, which I can't answer, it depends on whatever culture you're in. Um, but watch out, there are, well, in standardized exams in the US, everything is basically just multiple choice, in which case, it doesn't matter. Um, but the free response questions, I think the US is much more open now, at least the US is open to, if a student can do a method that seems to be correct and can explain what she or he is doing, grand, they accept that. The British system, I think, is different. I think it's still asking for specific methods. Am I right or wrong about that? Okay, in which case, what can you do? Then you have to play that game. Uh, yep. The explain uh, the explain what the fabulous. Oh, there you are. Sorry. And uh, thank if you. It, if it's okay, I want your contact. We want uh, like to be explained to the governmental school because <laughs> I have some like communicate with them. If because for right, all so. Of so my life now, so I'm, I'm a very strange creature. So I had that basically 10 years of university teaching, 10 years of high school teaching, ebb and flow between the two. And now my life is nothing but doing outreach work and going around the globe presenting joyous mathematics to the world. So there are various school districts, school governments that are seeing this sort of thing and are interested. So it is happening. Um, for example, in the US, there's one curriculum team that is actually starting to incorporate exploding dots into their curriculum. So there's a chance then they might reach the national scene in the US, which is fabulous. Um, I know folks in Alberta, Canada, there's a school district up there that's actually teaching this right now. So it is happening. And again, I don't know how to turn that great big weight of the mathematical education system around, but there are little moments happening all across this globe. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping personally, that this will make enough splash if I just keep saying it loud enough. Maybe there's something here that's worthy of actually being in most curricula, not just but, uh, the isolated ones. And the website, I cannot, I can have the email or someone to contact with. You can have the website you give us what I do with it I mean the website it does have the communication or the emails oh. okay uh, here, here, hello world have my email address <laughs> tanton.math at gmail.com how's that you'll find me if you just google my name you'll find me that's why I'm not worried about sharing my email like that Oh, do you know what? This could be a 26-1 machine, because I've got 26 different symbols going on. Welcome to base 26. <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. What number is my name in base 26? What number is your name? Now we're to talking. That's a good question. Is that, is that, have I done it for you? Is that your answer? You now reach me? OK. All right. Oh, yes. I have a question. Um, how did you figure out that the three to one to two is the half, the base half. Because, you know, 
I'm an honest mathematician. I don't know anything. I really don't. So I'm going to be really slow. I've got no, no, whoops, three, two. I've got no troubles being very, very slow and deliberate in my thinking because that's just how I am. We do know dots here are worth one. Is that right? That's fine. It's always set the game. So we know three of these, three ones, that's three, must equal two of those. So those two must equal three. So what's one of them? Three halves, yeah? Now, next box over. We know three three halves, remember, as you should write this down, three three halves is two of, oh, I don't know what these are. I'll write W because I don't know what they are, two watts. It must be two watts. So what's what? Divide by two. Oh, what is three halves squared? Three of these, three three half squareds, three half squared, three of them. You still see me? Yep. Must equal two of these. I really don't know what they are. K for no. Two of those ones. Yeah? So what's K? Divide by two. <gasps> three halves cubed. Welcome to base one and a half. Here's, okay. Base one and a half really freaks me out. Because we said that 13 was two, one, two, one, I think it was. It was my other chips. And my gut, my instinct does not believe that. I mean, look at these fractions. This is one. That's three tooths. This is three halves times three halves. That's nine fourths. And this is three halves times three halves and three halves. That's 27 eighths. Look at those fractions. They're horrible. Yet somehow, two of the first fraction, one of the second next fraction, two of the next fraction, and one one add up to a whole number, 13. I find that remarkable. My, my, my instincts tell me that can't be true. Is it true? Do two 27 eighths and one 9 fourth and two 3 tooths and one one-th, is that really equal 13 on the nose? Well, I guess it should, but just I just don't believe it. Is it? 27, two 27, is that 27 fourths? And nine fourths? Okay, that's 36 fourths plus uh, two, three, two, so that's just three plus one. 36 fourths, well, 36 fourths, fourths plus four. Whoa, really is working. 13 can be written as a combination of those horrible fractions. In fact, every whole number can be written as a combination of those ghastly fractions. Wild. So that's how I know it's base three and a half. How's that? Hi. Hi. Uh, so I'm a special education needs teacher, uh -huh. and uh, I really like this way because many uh, children that have uh, dyscalculia, you know, they prefer seeing like dots or certain things instead of seeing a lot of numbers. Yep. So would you recommend using this way? And like, do you have any special way to deal with children that have uh, math difficulties? Uh, well, I mean, other than just try this method. The, the danger, the, the hard part about this, if you do this with um, very young children, this in its, in its own right can become just very mechanical without any sort of understanding. So this is why I personally prefer that this story be out to the world about grades, high grades, grades four, five, and up, where there's always some element of place value in mind. However, now, having just said that, I'll contradict myself. You can actually do this method for place value from the very early grade. If you do it very carefully, make sure that understanding is there as you go along. Yeah. So I don't want people to fall into the trap. If I just make kids do this, they'll get it means place value. It has to be couched very carefully. And it's possible. It's doable. But just be very conscious of that. So I don't know how to answer your question. The answer is actually yes. But I advise you very carefully as a, as a, as a thinking adult how to make sure there really is the context of the story for your fabulous kids, not just be, it becoming mechanical. Okay. So it, it takes some thinking for you. Yeah. But I, the answer is yes, if you find that right path that's right for your kids. Okay, so thank you. Think thank well you about very it, much. That's important, and this could really help. And yes, I also find kids really love doing this and representing their own ways of doing it. For example, you'll see on my website, there's some kids in Portland, Oregon, in the US, that are making videos of how to explain this to other kids 
But what they're doing is they draw boxes in sidewalk chalk on the playground field and use stones. A, a, a video came to me this morning from Russia where one teacher drew these great big squares on the, um, in their classroom floor and the kids themselves stood in the squares and they pushed each other out and jumped over to their, to their squares. So they're actually <laughs> representing numbers themselves. And they were just conceptualizing the process for themselves. That, I think, the kids are really, they're never going to forget that. And if they've got the context that means place value, they will really own that. And I think you'll do it, right? Um, some other kids, I've got a film from someone some, in Spanish to me, so I don't understand what they're saying, so I presume they're saying the right thing. But they had bowls of grapes. They were just eating the grapes out of the bowls. Each bowl was a box, and they had the grapes yeah. go from... So, I mean, let the kids invent their own way yeah, of portraying it. Yeah, they're very creative, it. actually. You so, yes, that. in yeah. which case, you, you're there. You've got Thank them. Thank you, yeah. Do it, yes. Question in the front. For the microphone. Thanks. So, you mentioned that... Um, I can't remember what the name of the mathematician was. I think you said it was in the 1600s. Napier. Um, yeah, that Logarithms. he explored um, two dimensions yes. with the boxes mm -hmm. and how it somehow had significance to square roots and such. I know you said we should explore it ourselves and find out, but I was wondering, has anyone ever attempted three dimensions with the boxes? And if so, Oops, does it have any see. significance? Uh, not that I know of. In which case, I say, explore it, find out. <laughs> no, I don't know. I have not seen that. In which case, I mean, that makes you think you probably establish cube roots if you get your brain to think three-dimensionally. That's kind of fun. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> I will tell you some, these young kids that were playing with sidewalk chalk also did one thing. They put a 3-1 machine this way. They put a 2-1 machine this way. So they actually made them different machines in different directions. In fact, they all also went other, all ways. They actually got decimals, well, not decimals, they got the binary version of decimals and the ternary version of decimals, and they've got base one and a half going on the diagonals, and they found all sorts of other weird bases on other lines. They were just completely playing, completely wild stuff. So not only go three dimensions, they mix up all the directions you go and what machines you're playing in. Life gets wild. Yeah? Um, I like the idea, and I think um, I, was, I am very interesting to teach my kids this idea. But do you think that uh, working with dots, we are looking always for shortcut. And the traditional way where we use the signs and the mm -hmm. uh, product uh, table, I think it's faster, isn't it? Yes, um, absolutely. In fact, um, if speed is your goal, absolutely do the traditional way. The traditional way is good because it uses very little ink. If paper and pencils are pe precious to you, that's great. That's why it was actually done a lot in the 1700s. Paper and pressure was ink. It was, was precious. What I'm saying here, there's no way I would personally keep drawing boxes and dots. It is tedious. In fact, you'll even, do you remember at one point, I even got tired of drawing dots myself. I just wrote the number 27. You will find, if you let kids do this, they too will be their natural human selves. You get bored of drawing dots, so don't. You just start writing numbers. You wouldn't bother drawing the boxes anymore. You'd probably just write the numbers in a row. You probably start inventing all sorts of shortcuts. And guess what your shortcuts will look like in the end? Something like this. I always found it very strange for me as a kid and for many kids across the world. This is the end result of a human process. Of course, any sane person will want to do the shortest, quickest way first. But that's not where the human brain started. That's the end of the human brain. The human brain did very clunky things first and got more efficient. They got tired of drawing dots. They got tired of drawing boxes. So don't. So all I'm saying is, teach this with understanding. It doesn't be my way. I'm not saying my way is right. My way just happens to be good. Sorry, that sounded bad. My way happens to work well in my circumstances. So, um, and in the end, it gives context and meaning to this. Of course use that. If you need to be speed and efficient, of course do that. But also be honest. We're in the 21st century. If I really needed 276 divided by 12, would I pull out a piece of paper and pencil? No way. I would pull out this. I'm serious. This is the world we live in. Kids know that. So why are we teaching? You've got to be very clear. Why are we teaching that in this day and age? I'm not saying don't teach this. There needs to be a reason for everything we're doing. Teach it with thinking. That's all I'm asking. Just teach it with thinking. I'm not saying do my way, I'm not, saying do, I'm not saying do dots and boxes, I'm just saying teach with thinking, please, especially with this in everyone's pockets. Because we're not going to teach with thinking, they might as well just do this.
Sorry? So then you have to worry about what the assessments are. If the assessment's about getting speed answers and just to get answers, in which case that's the most efficient way to do it. That's the game you're playing. It's all context. I, I think it's more fun to think. I like thinking personally, but you know, what can I say? Wonderful. Oh, thank you. And well, that's it. We must be done. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>